Welcome, friends. It is always exciting to see so many people logging in from all over the United States and from all over the world. Uh, wow, I see so many countries here. This is very exciting to watch these live webinars with Dr. McDougall and guests. My name is Gustavo Tolosa, and I'm broadcasting live from Argentina. Dr. McDougall is live from Portland, Oregon, and Dr. Neil Barnard is live from Washington, D.C. DC. And um, it's just amazing to me how technology works when it works. Today, we have a um, legend, Dr. McDougall, of course, who is a pioneer in the movement that we all call whole food, plant-based, starch centered and we have a prominent and brilliant figure in the world of medicine as our guest, Dr. Neil Barnard, president of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. And I would like to thank you, gentlemen, and welcome you to today's webinar. Let's start with our host today, Dr. McDougall. How are you? Well, thank you. I'm just doing quite well. And uh, we're going to do things a little bit different uh, uh, during the webinars for the next uh, few weeks, maybe a few months, maybe a few years, who knows. Depends on how well it goes over. I pretty much told you everything I know in the 250 webinars that I posted on the website. So I've run out of things to talk about. But I have some really great friends who are uh, movers and shakers in this business. And the first one I have to introduce to you, I met, I believe, in 1983. Maybe she, he can correct it. I believe he was a resident in psychiatry. Maybe he was still in medical school, but it was 1983. And I believe it was the Hyatt Hotel in Washington, D.C. I was there doing uh, the Larry King show. How, Dr. Neil Bernard, correct me on those facts. I think you got it right about right. Um, and it's amazing to think about uh, all that has happened in that time. We're, we're still dealing with some of the same issues, but uh, the landscape has changed quite a lot. Well, we're going to talk about how the landscape has changed. But uh, you were you were interested, as few young doctors are. You were interested in uh, diet and other ways that you could cure people uh, with uh, common diseases. You were also very interested in animal rights, which is an emphasis that I didn't have back then, which I have right now. We can talk about my evolution to a, a, a more wide open, wide eyed person. Uh, so I have you to thank for uh, encourage me in the direction of appreciating other things than the human body's health, to appreciate the health of the animals and to appreciate the health of the planet. You were very important in uh, getting me to uh, look in that direction. I thank you, Dr. Neil Bernard. He is uh, the president, as uh, Gustavo told you, of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. If you go to their website, which is a big deal, which is uh, PCRM, Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, PCRM.org. And, uh, you know, I think one of the things you'll be struck by, first of all, is the quality of the website. And second of all, you will be amazed, like uh, with the McDougall website, that everything's free. You go, how can that be? CME credits, everything's free. Well, you know, I think Dr. Bernard has the same problem I have, and that is he discovered a long time ago that real happiness comes from helping other people. So, uh, how have things been going? Let's see, since 1983, that's a long time. What is it? It's a long time. I won't even do the math. Dr. Bernard, welcome to the webinar. We're going to be seen by a lot of people who are very, very interested in uh, making the same kind of progress we've made. And boy, oh boy, we need their help, don't we? Uh, we sure do. But thank you, John. I really appreciate your including me in this program. And thank you for all the wisdom that you've imparted to, uh, to me and to other people um, over all these years. You're right. I remember uh, vividly our, our first meeting back uh, three and some decades ago uh -huh. here in Washington. And I, I sought you out because at that point you were a fountain of knowledge. And I, I wanted to glom onto you and, and uh, get as much as I could. And you were very, very generous uh, at that time and have been ever since. So thank you for that. Yeah, but you know, you're one of the, well, I can't say the few people, everybody in their own way has tried to help people and the planet, you know, the environment, animal rights. And uh, I just happened to get started kind of early, but I, you know, I stand on the shoulders of some very important people like uh, Walter Kempner, Nathan Pritikin and Dennis Burkett and James Anderson and people you're familiar with. So uh, I'm glad that I was uh, an intermediary in knowledge that is ancient, goes back for mm, uh, thousands of years. 
And um, along the way, there have been people like uh, myself and you and Mr. Pritikin and Dr. Burkett and a few others uh, that have discovered this truth. But somehow or another, it doesn't get out. Why? <laughs> well, I do, I do think we're making progress. Um, we had our conference uh, that you have kindly spoken at in the past. Uh, the one that we did this past year, we had more than 1,000 doctors come. So there, there certainly is a growing interest, and, and these conferences are are uh, cropping up all over the place, and you've been a great pioneer there too. I think part of it, it is surprising when people don't realize that, say, diabetes can be improved, perhaps even disappear, that their arteries can open up again, that they can lose weight without counting calories. And when people learn these things, they get very excited about it. And, and, and yet at the same time, uh, there are still a lot of people, including a number of doctors, unfortunately, who haven't yet put this uh, way of eating to work in their own lives, and so they don't feel confident talking with patients about it. But uh, once you do, life is just, um, it, it really is a life-changing experience. All right, this has to be as uh, um, ununderstandable, if that's a word, uh, for you as it is for me. And that is, uh, the truth is, uh, is crystal clear in the scientific literature or in, in just looking through history. Uh, if you're a person of the letters, if you read, uh, you're a person of history. You're just uh, you know, a person who has common sense. It's so obvious that we are plant eaters. And it's so obvious, it's becoming obvious to people that we're destroying the planet by all of our meat eating habits, our livestock consumption. So tell me, you've been at this as long as I have. Tell me, why, have, why, have, why has the truth not become widespread? Uh, you know, why, why are the liars, cheaters, and polluters still out there doing what they should be doing? Uh, well, they, they have their own platforms. I mean, it's, it's not that we don't get a good message out there. It can be dwarfed by other messages, though. Um, for example, um, it was back 15 years ago when the National Institutes of Health gave our research team a grant to do a head-to-head -head test for people with type 2 diabetes of a conventional diabetes diet versus a completely plant-based diabetes diet. And as you know, the plant-based diet just um, was dramatically better. It, had a th it led to a three times better improvement in blood sugar control. It led to weight loss without counting calories. It really uh, became this, the, standard, the standard. And not only was it funded by the federal government, the first results were published by the American Diabetes Association in their journal, Diabetes Care. We presented it at the American Diabetes Association and, and everywhere. So it's, it's not that the word didn't get out there. Um, I have a book on it. We did a PBS special that was, has been viewed thousands and thousands and thousands of times at stations all over the place. However, a, as you know, probably better than anybody, there are other forces that are trying to get other messages out there. So they'll say, well, forget all that. Uh, just don't eat carbohydrate or do some other kind of diet. Um, or uh, I, don't, I don't need to tell you that the industry fights back too. I'm not making this up. In the state of Texas right now, the Texas Beef Board is promoting, it, it sends effectively sales representatives or promotional representatives to doctor's offices in the state of Texas, telling them that their patients with high cholesterol should be eating beef. The idea is that I'm not, I'm not making this up. Um, the Physicians Committee actually has a complaint into the Attorney General of the state of Texas to say, you cannot be doing this. But what they did is they do a research study that effectively shows that beef isn't a lot worse than chicken in essence. Um, and so they go around saying, well, your high cholesterol patients may as well go ahead and eat beef. And it's, it, they have uh, representatives visiting doctor's office just like a drug salesman doing this. We have uh, asked the attorney general to intervene. I'll let you know if we win or not. But the point being that why doesn't the word get out? The word does get out, but there is a whole lot of contrary message out there from people who are making money um, off selling <laughs> un, uh, unhealthy foods and in some cases selling drugs to try to... Uh, to uh, make up for uh, the dietary problems. Yeah, this um, trickle down effect uh, from the food industry goes uh, so many different places. Not only do they make a ton of money selling food poison to people in the form of dairy and, and all forms of livestock. So you got the, the big food companies making a lot of money. And of course you've got the growers selling feed uh, you've got uh, the people who are banking insecticides and pesticides out there making a ton of money. Because, of course, you need to grow more grains and, you know, more animal food when you produce livestock. 
And then you get people sick and we have uh, hospitals making money and doctors making money and the drug companies making money. And boy, it's just, there just seems to be no reason at all to be well, at least no <laughs> financial reason. Well, I, I think it's it, true. If everybody, if everybody were were uh, would eat right, probably doctors would have Wednesday afternoons off, and uh, hospitals would make a, a whole lot less money. Um, but I'm happy to say that there's lots of products uh, that are going in the opposite direction. As you said, some of them are free. Um, our website at the Physicians Committee, PCRM.org, has been completely revamped. And can I brag about? We have two new apps uh, for iPhone and for Android. Um, these are our new 21 day vegan kickstart apps in English and Spanish. Um, we've had about 600,000 people using the original of these, but they're all upgraded and new and we're super excited. And I hope people will jump in and do this. It's all free. There's no commercial sponsorship. You can just jump in and have fun with it. Yeah, this is uh, another place you can go where you'll get done after a week or two searching through the website and they'll say, where's the gimmick? <laughs> well, there is no gimmick, uh, you know, just like my website. Uh, exactly. Oh, I have one more thing I've got to tell you, John. i got one more thing. I have a new book out. I don't want to hear um, you. Know, I, I have to tell you about this new book. You know, I've written books. You've written so many great books, and I was inspired by that. But I have to tell you, the books I write are so big and thick, you can use them to prop open a door. Uh, so I have decided I've created this new book called The Vegan Starter Kit. And the, the idea is you can read the whole thing in 45 minutes, maybe an hour. Um, and it tells you everything you need to do to to get started, feel, to feel comfortable starting with a plant-based diet. Here it is. There it is, the vegan starter kit. And um, it's really skinny and cheap and simple. And it's on Amazon and everywhere else, so you can pre-order it. And so if a person wants to know why we want to change our diet, so I can reverse diabetes, I can lose weight without counting calories. Um, I can maybe reverse my heart disease or cut my cancer risk or sort out my digestive tract. And then simple steps to get started. Uh, a few dozen recipes, very, very simple recipes that you, just the idea is to give a person confidence in getting started. And I'm hoping that people will buy two copies, keep one, give the other one away to somebody that they love, or frankly, buy 20 copies and keep one, give the other 19 away. Um, I'm hoping that it'll be a way of getting the word out in so that it's not mysterious. You don't have to you don't have to have a Ph.D. or an M.D in order to put a healthy diet to work. So anyway, that's the vegan starter kit. I hope people will go on Amazon or Barnes and Noble or whatever and pick up copies and, and hopefully we can, we can spread the word a little bit further. Well, uh, Dr. Bernard, you must have at least 15 books that you've written. How many? Uh, something like that. Yeah. How, how many? Uh, somewhere along that, along no, those lines. Yeah. You, you can see them on, on your website. I had a, a brief look through them and I, they brought back a lot of memories of the times you and I spent together promoting the books and taking on different subjects. So there's uh, no lack of information being put out by yourself and PCRM. And uh, I encourage you to read Dr. Bernard's work. And if you haven't picked up already, he and I agree almost 100% on medical practice as well as uh, dietary issues. Uh, close enough to 100% that um, I can't think of anybody offhand that <laughs> There's a whole group of us that are so bent mentally in this direction that it's, uh, you know, it's pretty clear that we we believe strong that we're correct. It's also exciting to see these new frontiers that are coming along. For example, uh, when, as Nathan Pritikin showed, um, heart disease can be dramatically improved, and he personally showed that it can be reversed. And, and Dennis Burkett, whom you mentioned earlier, showed that so many conditions like gallbladder disease and colorectal cancer uh, are related to diet. Um, but then this new frontier with Alzheimer's disease, for example, where we're seeing that diet plays a role there too. It's not just age and genetics. Nothing is perfect. Um, these diseases can attack us no matter what. But on, but on the other hand, diet does give us a tremendous power for risk reduction. So it, it's an amazing thing to see what diet changes can actually do. Um, I think the new area, or I shouldn't say new, but new to many people is infl inflammation. Uh, I keep remembering and quoting your study, I think it was 2004, where you brought in people who had rheumatoid, arth rheumatoid arthritis and you could show that this autoimmune condition can improve, but it, which, is, which is true and, and the way you showed it was so elegant, but it's not the only autoimmune condition, it's asthma and Sjogren's syndrome and so many others. And this has opened up a whole new area where research is, is needed and people don't need to wait for, for new research studies. They can try out diet changes themselves. 
see if their asthma will go away or their Sjogren's or their rheumatoid arthritis or even thyroid conditions might improve with the diet change. All right. So um, I still hear you saying and hedging a little bit, you're saying it's associated with maybe uh, the strongest thing I hear from you is causally related. I mean, oh, come on, Dr. Bernard. Uh, when we talk about diet and diabetes, can't you say just clearly type 2 diabetes is caused by eating the Western diet and it's cured nearly 100% of the time by eating the kind of diet you and I recommend? I mean, I don't want to hear any hesitation. Yeah, well, it's, it's been an amazing thing. So many people have the idea that type 2 diabetes is caused by eating sugar or eating bread, which digests to release sugar into the blood and that kind of thing. And we've really worked long and hard to try to dispel that notion and to help people understand uh, what is a, just a slightly more complicated story about how diabetes starts, which is that you have your ham sandwich with mayo and cheese on it and particles of fat get into the bloodstream and those particles of fat enter the muscle cells and the liver cells. And when the cells fill up with fat, they make insulin unable to signal effectively. It can't get the sugar out of the blood into the cell because the cells filled with fat particles. Um, so you go on the McDougall diet or a plant-based diet that's also low in fat. And what happens? The fat starts dissipating from the cells. Um, we call it intramyocellular lipid, but it's dissipating. And then insulin can start working again. And when the insulin works again, it can pull the sugar out of the blood into the cell and the diabetes improves or flat out goes away. Yeah, I was just and, saying, I wanna hear you, it goes away. Yeah, and I the earlier- It's 100% curable by definition. I think it also depends on how soon I get a person. If a person has had, if, if, they, if the diabetes is starting and they change their diet, it is miraculous to see what will happen with that person. If they've had diabetes for 30 years, I know they can improve. I'm not sure if I'm gonna get the, di the disease to go away depending on, on the beta cells of their pancreas. Uh, if the pancreas has been really beaten up, they're gonna have more trouble. But interestingly enough, here at the Physicians Committee, we did a study, 16 week trial, in people who are overweight and many cases insulin resistant, but they did, get, did not yet have diabetes. And we tracked not just their weight and their lipids, but we also tracked the beta cells in their pancreas. Those are the cells that make insulin. Those are the cells that when they give up and you can't make insulin anymore, you end up with diabetes. Um, and what we found was amazing. Um, not only does the insulin resistance diminish, their insulin sensitivity gets better, but the, the cells in the pancreas that make insulin, those beta cells, start to rejuvenate to a degree. Their, their function is stronger. So I wasn't prepared to see that, but we published that result a few months ago. And um, it's been really uh, amazing to see what diet changes will do, and that's one of them. Well, I guess the confusion for the, our listeners is we're both talking about the same thing. When I say type 2 diabetes, I'm talking about a fully functional pancreas. Right. Uh, that produces as much insulin, sometimes twice as much insulin as somebody without diabetes. And what you're describing very clearly that I understand well is something that I refer to as type one and a half diabetes, where they have partial insulin uh, insufficiency. In other words, they have enough beta cells, insulin producing cells to keep them out of the hospital, keep them out of ketoacidosis, but uh, not enough to bring their blood sugar down to normal or to keep the weight loss from occurring. Sometimes they lose too much weight. But yeah, there are a lot of people out there that come to see us who have, as you describe, a, a long-term disease, a worn out pancreas. And uh, that I refer to as type one and a half diabetes, type one being no insulin production, type two being full insulin production and more. I call it one and a half, which is partial, partial insulin insufficiency as you well described it. I just wanted to make sure our listening audience knew we were all, both talking off the same sheet. Exactly. And, and, you know, but even those people that you described as one and a half, even they are going to improve a lot. Oh, yeah. You know, um, it, it, I would not recommend any other diet for these people other than a whole foods, plant based diet. It, throw out all the extra oil and grease, um, because what are you going to do? Um, you're you may not get that person off insulin because their pancreas is just not functioning anymore. But the, what is going to kill a person with diabetes isn't a high blood sugar. It's going to be vascular damage. It's the damage to the blood vessels of the heart. And along the way, the, the blood vessels to the kidneys or the legs or the eyes are gonna be damaged. And that's why they end up with visual loss uh, or amputations. And you don't, you don't wanna risk 
any further arterial damage at all. So you want to get all the cholesterol out of your diet, get all the animal fat out and baby those arteries. And a person with diabetes can live a normal life. Um, but as you said, get to a person earlier, early enough when their pancreas is still functioning. And uh, it's amazing. You see people who thought they could never get rid of their diabetes and it is flat out gone. I was talking with a man the other day who was so proud because his, uh, his doctor working at the VA hospital had managed to eliminate uh, diabetes from his, uh, com completely eliminate diabetes from his medical record. Huh. Well, then, you know, if I was going to say, here's that you are a man who's experienced it, you know, almost as much time as I have and take care of patients. And I know you do take care of patients. You know, you touch them, you feel them, you talk to them. So you're a real doctor. Uh, I'm going to, you know, make some statements and you correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. All right. Uh, is constipation pretty much on And I mean, pretty much. There are always exceptions. Is it pretty much curable with the kind of diet we recommend? In about 20 hours. Okay. Exactly. So, yeah. so we cure constipation. How about uh, obese people and weight loss? Does, does it ever fail if uh, some people follow a high carbohydrate, low fat diet? And I mean, watching the nuts and seeds also. Yeah, it's, it's an amazing thing. In fact, we just just yesterday finished a 16 week trial in people who joined us for exactly that reason. They were overweight. Um, they had been on every diet known to humanity and they lose weight and the weight comes back on. And so what we did is we used uh, exactly what you're talking about, completely plant based diet, vegan diet, no animal products. You also keep the oils really low, uh, focus on whole foods and you put everybody on your digital scale week by week and they do great. Um, I mean, Yes, you asked, does everybody lose weight? They do lose weight. Um, and if for whatever reason a person doesn't, what I'll always do is I'll say, write down what you're eating. And you, you look into it and you find the contraband and you knock it out and it's, yeah. it's an amazing thing to see. And the beauty of it is you're, you're not carb counting. You're not uh, wrestling with how many calories you eat. You're not going to bed hungry. You're eating food, but the foods you're eating are healthy. And the reasons for this are, first of all, that as you know, Carbohydrates really don't have a lot of calories, so your calorie intake drops. But the other thing that we found that's super exciting is our patients come in and we, we put them on an exam table and we measure their metabolism. Um, we actually see how fast they're burning calories minute by minute. And what we find is that their calorie burning speed in the after meal period is actually higher than it was before. And the patients come in, they say, my metabolism is terrible. I, you know, now I just look at food, I gain weight. When I was a kid, I could eat anything, but now I gain weight. Um, and they're right. I mean, their calorie burning speed really is, is low. But when they go on a healthier diet, their metabolism increases, not a lot, in, in our studies, about 16% increase in their after meal calorie burn, which is a great thing. Well, our mutual friend, Kevin Hall from the NIH. Yeah, proved he's, a, he's a great scientist. I mean, he's one of the top scientists in the world. He proved that clearly that carbohydrates uh, resulted in more efficient burning of calories. And, uh, but you know, the, the low carbers have fought back. The high, fat, the high fat promoters have fought back and have tried to publish uh, scientific literature to contradict uh, Kevin Hall's work. And of course they've been caught, you know, they cheat. Uh, they uh, skew their methods such that they get the results they want. And Dr. Hall's not happy about that. And uh, I didn't particularly care because uh, it was pointed out enough times by other people that these folks, these low carb, high fat, Atkins type people are just plain and simple liars. You know, that's a word we can use these days, isn't it? Back when you and I started, we, we would never call somebody a liar or a crook or a thief. Uh, re Regrettably, it, it seems to be a word that we're using more often than we Oh, used you to. know what? Maybe <laughs> I think it's appropriate. Why don't we we'll just cut cut the speed and uh, not say things like, well, maybe he's misinformed. He's a damn liar is what he is. I don't know why why these low carbers are doing it. And it's not just the low carbers. You know, if you watch the journals in terms of medical therapies, uh, devices, uh, heart surgeries, medications, and so on. These people who are publishing in the journals and the scientists who are doing, quote, research are being caught left and right. Have you um, noticing that? Yes, well, I know, I know exactly what you mean. And here, here's a concern that I have about low carb diets um, that I think people often don't recognize. Uh, a person goes on a low carb diet 
and they lose weight, which is not surprising because carbohydrates are about half of what your average person eats. Um, if you take out all the fruit and all the bread and all the pasta and all the beans and all the sweet potatoes, um, and if you don't replace them with calories, um, you will lose weight and that happens. But as you know, what you're left with is typically meat, there's chicken, there's fish and egg whites and so forth uh, left in the diet. And normally when a person loses weight, really almost no matter how they lose weight, their cholesterol will fall. On average, maybe about a point off your total cholesterol per pound of body weight that you lose. Except if the weight you lost weight was on a low carb diet, what we see is about a third of people, despite the fact that they're losing weight because they're kind of starving it off, about a third of people have their cholesterol levels go up, um, sometimes massively, and you've seen this, um, where they, their cholesterol levels go really high. And that's because they're suddenly eating, a, they're not eating the high fiber foods and instead they're eating meat and uh, sometimes cheese and other things like that. So I really encourage people to not go on this low carb route. And if they do go on it, they end up often disappointed anyway. It's better to start with the foods that your body really was designed for. All right, even Atkins reports 70% of his patients had uh, constipation and about a similar amount had halitosis. And, uh, you know, I mean, the studies that you, you've done, your group has done some of them to uh, counteract uh, the low carb. In fact, I mean, that brings to mind something you and I did together. Do you remember when Atkins uh, died and uh, a year and a half? I was later, afraid you were going to bring that up, yes. Ah, yeah, we, did, we got in a little trouble for that, didn't we? Uh, going on um, going on CNN, New York Times, and well, I don't know. Uh, yes. All the major newspapers, uh, and you, you were kind enough to split the duties with me, and also <laughs> and well, punishment uh, for bringing out the fact that when Atkins died, he was obese, uh, and he had extensive artery disease, which he lied about on the Larry King show, whereas uh, his wife, after his death, put his angiograms up, uh, which showed extensive atherosclerosis. Sad to say, uh, I don't have those angiograms anymore, thanks to a fire. But, uh, you know, it, it just uh, plain and simple lied about it. And uh, Well, you know, it, it was a troubling but thing. But the point is, you and I went out on a massive campaign together, and we got almost all the media's attention worldwide, including yeah, the New York it, Times and so on. And, and, and we told it clearly, this is a fat, sick guy. It, it was a troubling situation because because Atkins um, had really gone through a, quite a resurgence and people were going left and right onto this Atkins diet. And, and it was a typical low carb diet where they were hoping that they would lose weight. And, and over the short run, many people did lose weight. Um, but he promised them that all the butter and meat that they were eating would not hurt their heart. Um, and what he had hidden was the fact that he himself had heart disease. And when he died, um, his he, he had an autopsy that was performed. And the autopsy results were released to a doctor named Fleming who lived in the Midwest. And Dr. Fleming sent me this report and said, people ought to know that he had coronary artery disease and that he was obese and um, because he's been promising that people will lose weight and be thin on, on this healthy diet. And so we, here at the Physicians Committee, we weighed this situation. We decided that the media ought to be aware of this. And so we did release uh, this report. And, um, and we had to weigh this quite a bit because this was an autopsy report that was um, a technical report and it would, would have, uh, it wasn't a medical chart or anything like that, but we did make the decision to, to release it. And I think on the, on balance, it was the right thing to do. Um, and it, 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 as you said, that people said, no, 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 he couldn't possibly have had heart disease, but in fact he did. And, um, well, he lied, he lied about anyway. He well, lied, he, he yeah. lied uh, you know, I can remember on the Larry King show yeah. him lying about having coronary artery disease. So, yes, you know, um, it, yes. And this, this was in the days when people were less accustomed to hearing um, prominent people lie. Like yeah, 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 it was not um, back then. That was 20 years ago. That was not acceptable. But today it's a different story. Uh, unfortunately, but yes, um, that that happened, and and I'm happy to say that since that time, I think people have taken a much more jaded view of uh, low carb diets, but they still don't go away. There, uh, they sometimes remind me of the cicadas that are in the trees here in Washington. Every 17 years, they come out of the ground, and and then they they make a lot of noise in the trees, and then they go back into the ground for another 17 years. And while they're in the ground, they write books about low carb diets, and oh. 17 years later, they come back with another one. So it was. Uh, 
whatever the low carb diet was in the 50s and then Atkins came up and then it was after that it was uh, South Beach and then it was ketogenic diets but they're all they all have this idea that uh, you shouldn't eat carbohydrates but the the problem of course is as you've written about so eloquently um, if you look at the most healthful longest lived populations they have high carbohydrate intakes and they always have a starch food that is their staple like in Okinawa the sweet potatoes um, or in other parts of Japan it might be rice um, and in, in uh, e even in the United States, um, the longest of populations are the Adventists who are eating plant-based diets, uh, either completely or mostly. So anyhow, the, the low-carb diet uh, it seems not to go away, just like any other kind of quick fix. But uh, luckily, the evidence supporting a healthier approach is, is really quite robust. The other thing I remember you and I had some fun with worldwide was in October of, I don't know what year, but I know it's October because that's Breast Cancer Awareness Month which is uh, sponsored by one of the drug companies. You probably remember. Yeah, I I Imperial Chem Chemical Industries, yes. Yeah, okay, and, but Octo and I've written about uh, October every year, the Breast Cancer Awareness Month. It's really breast cancer treatment awareness and prevention awareness and money awareness. Uh, but you and I went out on the road. You went to the East Coast, I went to the West Coast. We got together for a few shows. Uh, how do you feel these days? I mean, 20 years ago, we went on the road. We went on all the you know biggest TV and radio shows we could get on. We tried to tell people a very simple thing about breast cancer awareness, and that is that it doesn't do a darn bit of good. Well, no, let's just put it this way. It does more harm than good. Uh, and we were talking about mammograms. Uh, how do you feel um, these days about mammograms? Okay, well, bad news and good news. Um, the bad news is that, that as you said, um, the Breast Cancer Awareness Month was designed to make people aware. It wasn't designed to reduce their risk. And it was troubling for people to realize that the sponsor, the, the originator of this program, was Imperial Chemical Industries that made medications to treat breast cancer. So their whole goal was to get as many women to have mammograms as possible so that they would find uh, cancer and then initiate treatment. Um, that's all the bad news. But I've got some good news. Um, there are many, many practitioners who have a better approach. In fact, let me, let me, right on my desk, can I show you this? This is a book by Christy Funk. And Christy is a terrific heart, uh, not heart surgeon, breast cancer surgeon. And this is a terrific book. When Dr. Funk was writing the part about nutrition, she said the nutrition to protect your breast health is a plant-based diet, a vegan diet. And she pulls no punches. So anyway, let me say a, a, a word of praise for Christy Funk. She's done a terrific job with that. She's really known as um, an outstanding surgeon and has worked with many, many celebrity clients as well. But she's a down to earth, very uh, sharp physician who tells it like it is. And I've been really, really um, uh, pleased to see that there's a whole generation of doctors now who really want women to be empowered, to be able to tell, take their health into their hands and not simply be used as marketing ploys for, for drugs or surgery. Well, you said there's a good side, and that is this uh, fine young woman who's uh, writing about breast cancer. But do you know two of our friends just basically got thrown out of the business? And those two friends are uh, Peter Gertzky, the head of the uh, Cochrane Collaboration. He was fired. You know that, right? Yeah, I, I've heard that, yeah, yeah unfortunately. And, and H. Gilbert Welch, from Dartmouth College, who has spent mm, his good share of his life publishing in the big five medical journals about the fallacy of early detection and how we get overdiagnosed and so on. He has been basically censored out of the business by being accused of plagiarism. Now, I know H. Gilbert Welch and I know uh, Peter, you know, quite well to know that these are honest men. And I have to believe the motivation behind uh, uh, their firings and their uh, incriminations was uh, uh, from people who believe otherwise for financial reasons, ego reasons, and so on. So it's not all good, uh, Dr. Bernard. <laughs> um, you're you're right about that. You know, two of the most you, powerful people in the world, two of the most powerful people in the world in terms of breast cancer were just fired. Yeah. Human nature is, is, uh, is such that, that uh, a good message uh, gets uh, attracts uh, enemies and people will try to squelch it. Um, uh, however, you know, it, I've seen two, two countervailing trends. On the one hand, it, pe more people than ever are taking an interest in healthy diets. And to be convinced of that, you just have to go into a health food store. 30 years ago, a health food store was a tiny little place where the cashier was named Sunday. 
sunshine and they had products that were covered with dust and they were playing folk music. Today, you go into a health food store and there are hundreds of people coming in there and they are looking for healthy products. They want to improve their diet and they're not playing folk music anymore. Um, and things are changing. Uh, there are more products than ever before. There are so many people uh, writing great books and creating great websites that this is a movement that has arrived. Um, I remember 10 or 15 years ago, people weren't sure how to pronounce vegan. They would call it vegan or vegan or something like that. Um, the number of people trying a healthier approach is bigger than it's ever been. That said, the number of people who need help in many ways is bigger than it's ever been too. I mean, there are people eating cheese and eating meat, not realizing that these things are really uh, creating problems for them. So I'm seeing two, two quite different um, and opposing uh, trends, unfortunately. You know, one of the things I've always admired about you is your optimism. You, you know, no matter how bad it seems, how bad, <laughs> You, know, you always have a smile. You always have a good thing to say about uh, everybody. And uh, I guess that's why you've done so well, Dr. Bernard. Uh, you, are, um, you, are, you are known as, as you're known by the celebrities uh, worldwide. Your, your organization gets, what, $20 million in donations a year. Uh, you stand up. You know, you, you just have that wonderful personality that gives people confidence and uh, doesn't feel, may make them feel threatened. And uh, well, what a position you've played. Thank you for saying that, John. I have to say, I don't know that we're optimists. We're not pessimists, but I think what we are is, if we're not optimist or pessimist, I think what we could say is we are determined. Um, it reminds me a little bit after um, World War I, when, the, when people wondered, can we somehow prevent this from happening again? And the League of Nations uh, was beginning. The diplomats at that time said, well, we're not optimists, we're not pessimists, but we're determined. And, and I think that's kind of where we are is that we, we know what we need to do. We've just got to get the word out there as much as we possibly can. Well, you know, uh, as a team, and that team involves you and I and other guests that are going to be on this show, like Dr. Esselstyn and Dr. Colin Campbell and Dr. Dean Ornish and mm -hmm. Garth Davis. I mean, I got, I got the whole crew lined up for future webinars. What I'd like to do, because I know you've got other things going on, and I do too, and the people are probably, they probably had enough of hearing all this uh, confidence that we know what's right in terms of medical treatment and, and diet. I'd like you to review for just a minute some of the things that you're doing at PCRM. I'd like to hear more about your books. I'd like to hear how people can get involved. I mean, I know you have a, a big volunteer staff, uh, why they should go to your website. I, you know, tell us about this because I, I think we've piqued their interest in just the short time you've given us. Oh, well, well thank you. Um, for people who are not aware of the Physicians Committee, we, we do lots of things. Um, we do, first of all, clinical research studies. Uh, we've done many of them over the years. It's headed by an endocrinologist, Dr. Hanna Kaliova. She heads our clinical research uh, programs. We're doing studies right now on weight loss, rheumatoid arthritis, and one on dietary cholesterol. Those are all active studies right now. Uh, in the new year, we're starting a new study, doing a head-to-head -head trial of a Mediterranean versus a vegan diet. We do these studies. They're, 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 they're challenging and they're expensive, but they are so important. So that's what we do. We also have educational programs like our Kickstart program that I mentioned earlier. Um, and uh, we do books like this, like the Vegan Starter Kit. Let me make a shameless plug for this one again. Oh, please do. And we'll, we'll make sure we promote it to our, all of Thank our you. I hope you, hope you will. It's um, on, online now. Um, and our Kickstart program online and our apps online. And for doctors, we have Nutrition CME, Continuing Medical Education, Nutrition CME, and our annual conference. And we also do a lot of work to try to modernize research itself. So that instead of trying to model diabetes in a rat or mouse, why don't we study diabetes in people whom we can help by doing ethical, uh, careful research to help tackle the cause of that disease. So those are things that we're doing. Uh, we're also very active in policy. As you know, we have uh, litigated against the US government to open up the process by which the dietary guidelines are set. Those are the guidelines that determine what kids are, are fed in schools. And, Back in 2000, we successfully sued the U.S. government to make sure that process was open and transparent. Um, in this past year in the state of California, we got a law passed so that every hospital must serve plant-based meals. Every prison must serve plant-based meals. Uh, in 2019, I think we're going back to see what we can do about schools, which often serve not the best uh, foods. Um, we've been very active working with the AMA, which in the past was not very strong on nutritional issues, but has really, I think, made itself proud in recent years by calling for schools and hospitals and other places 
to have more healthful options, which is terrific. Um, so those are a few of the things that we do, but uh, we are only as strong as our membership. And so I'm, I'm very grateful to people who support our work. As you know, I'm a volunteer here. I don't take a salary. Um, and I'm very pleased when people support the work that we're doing. Well, I've, I've taken uh, more time than I, you know, we had planned, uh, but I didn't ask you one question. I don't know whether you want to take the time to get into it or just kind of okay. walk with for another day. And that is you've done something that, uh, that I, I've been doing for 40 years, and that is you've set up a, uh, a patient a doctor's office type. Oh, yes. Yeah. And I, I'd like to know if you have time to tell us, uh, you know, how that's going, you, your office practice. Can people get involved? Can they come and see one of your doctors? Uh, you know, is it, is it working out for you? Oh, it's great. Yes. Um, in fact, um, we have modeled much of what we do after, after the, what, your own pioneering work. But the Barnard Medical Center is here in Washington, D.C. It's right over there. Um, the Barnard Medical Center is a nonprofit clinic, but we have doctors, nurse practitioners, registered dietitians, medical assistants, and class teachers. And here's how it works. Uh, the patient comes in to see the doctor. The doctor says, you've got diabetes. In fact, your diabetes is in poor control. And if the patient is already on medications, we might continue that or we may not. But the key thing is we then say the diabetes is not caused by a deficiency of metformin or whatever other oral drug you're on. It's caused by foods. So let's address foods. And then the registered dietitians can take it from there and they sit down with the patient and the patient's reluctant spouse and they map out a healthy diet for, for the patient and they understand why they're making the change. And then the patient says, well, I need a little support. How do I stay on the straight and narrow? We have classes every week that the patient can attend for free forever. So between the doctor helping them understand what's going on, the registered dietitian mapping out their, their healthy diet, the classes that keep them on the straight and narrow, every single person that I hire in this clinic follows a plant-based diet personally so they know how to make it work. And it is the coolest thing. The patients love it, but the staff loves it too because they know they've got a whole team backing them up. Well, I wish you continued luck uh, and success. Uh, you know, it's been almost 40 years. You and I have been trying to do something that uh, I know I once believed would be easy to make, to make other people understand common sense and the truth. But after four decades, I have to say, you know, I'm... I'm not discouraged. I'm discouraged a little bit, but uh, I'm back. And I, I, I hope you think about me every time you have some opportunities where you think I can contribute to what you're doing. Because I, I have to say, Dr. Neil Bernard, you are uh, probably the most influential person. And I don't say this with uh, uh, with any, any casual conceptions about it, because I've thought about it many times over the years, I've thought about Dr. Ornish and Dr. Esselstyn, and Dr. Colin Campbell and Dr. Bernard. You know, it, you may say it's hard to say who's made the most uh, important contribution, but I have, I'll have to tell you, don't tell Dr. Ornish or Esselstyn <laughs> example of this, don't tell you. I have to say you have uh, really been most instrumental in getting most people to listen to what's going on. And it has to do with your personality, uh, your Un, uneasy efforts and your strong belief. And I certainly appreciate it very much. And I know well, people out there do too. Well, John, it's nice of you to say that, but I, I have to, to be clear that you taught me a lot of the things that I know now. Um, and then you and I have learned together as the research keeps coming out. Uh, that's been number one. And I have been hugely inspired by the work that Dean Ornish has done. He's been just a, a role model for me in the yeah. elegant research that he's done. And I will never forget, it was 1991. 1991, that Colin Campbell got out of Ithaca, New York, came here to Washington and stood with me and Dennis Burkett um, and Oliver Alabaster from George Washington University, where we said we ought to be not requiring meat and dairy in federal programs at all. Um, so Colin has been a mentor and Esselstyn, uh, Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn has been just so inspiring with uh, his ability to change things. So um, all of us have been working together and uh, you have been spearheading this courageously for a long period of time. Um, and you're right, you know, what you said, the whole world isn't changing. The whole world isn't becoming a non-smokers, but uh, they're not all throwing away bad habits. They're not all, not all following a healthy diet. But for any individual, 
the process can be really easy and really quick. And that's what I'm seeing. So I'm very optimistic for what people can do one at a time. And we are getting closer and closer to that tipping point where everybody kind of twigs the message. It's not just good for our health. As you mentioned earlier, the animals will wave a flag, the, the environment will breathe a lot easier, and uh, your coronary arteries won't argue either. Dr. Bernard, I want to thank you very much. Uh, I look forward to the next time we have you on the show. Uh, in addition to your new book and your older books, which people can get on Amazon, and uh, contact with PCRM, which is pcrm.org, you can go to my website and you'll find uh, some interviews that I've done with Dr. Bernard. And I think you'll find them uh, very interesting. We may even have a lecture or two that you've done at our program. So we've inspired you. We've uh, got your interest. And uh, you know that there's more people out there than Dr. McDougall and Mary McDougall and Gustavo trying to win this battle that's uh, essential. Thank you very much. Thank you, very much. Thank you, John. Thank you for including me. I really appreciate it.